on behalf of Siki, I'm welcoming you all for this uh, interactive session on post budget. Now I request Mr. Sriram, Chair, Taxation Committee, Siki, to give the welcome remarks, and uh, I request you to take it forward, sir, please. Thank you, thank you, and uh, thank you one and all for joining uh, today's uh, budget session of Southern India Chamber of Commerce. Uh, really appreciate that you have taken your time out to join us in this uh, discussions. Uh, <clears throat> as usual, every year we do this session, and uh, this year we wanted to do the session little later to the actual date of the budget being presented, which is on. Am I audible? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, yes, okay. So this time around, we took almost 10 days to do this session deliberately because we wanted to really uh, look at the devil uh, and the details. What is contained in the fine print? Because typically in any session, uh, people will keep saying that uh, they have to read the details before they come and finally what the budget holds uh, essentially. So this time around, what we did is we had good amount of time for us to prepare for the details and and each of the speaker i'm sure will bring the finer point of the budget uh, because we have had sufficient time of 10 days to prepare for this particular session so uh, we are really uh, that way prepared uh, well uh, for the details itself so that's the uh, uh, you know uh, point with which i wanted to start this uh, session and of course to uh, just to set the context of how we are going to go about, besides me, of course, I'm I'm just going to do a, uh, you know, opening remark and then uh, some amount of moderation. But other than that, we have Dr. Samandam, uh, who is the chair of the Southern India Chamber of Commerce uh, Economic uh, Committee, and also he is an administrative officer in the Hindu Public Policy and uh, Research. Uh, he will be uh, sharing his economic uh, perspective from the economy point of view, uh, which are contained in the budget proposals. We also have Sudha Mayapan, who will also uh, really uh, dwell deep into the economic, uh, uh, you know, uh, rationale for this budget. And I'm sure she will uh, bring the fine print uh, analysis to the discussions. Uh, this will be the uh, uh, part A of our discussions, like typical budget. And part B, we will have. Uh, the tax proposals discussed by T.G. Suresh, uh, leading chartered accountant, uh, a very good name in direct taxes, and he is going to talk about and take us through the details of the direct tax proposals. And uh, I have also Mr. Ramani, uh, who is an expert in indirect taxes. He will uh, talk about and take us through the indirect tax proposals. So this is the uh, the construct of this particular session. And before I uh, hand it over to uh, Dr. Samandam to uh, really uh, provide the overall perspective of the budget from the economic standpoint. I have a few observations which I wanted to share for maybe five minutes, and uh, after that, I will request to Dr. Samandam to come in. Uh, the first and foremost, of course, is that we all know that uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the twenty uh, the first of the twenty five years of the uh, Indi independent. In India, where we are heading towards uh, uh, the 100 years of uh, uh, India independence by 2047. So, the budget is set in the context of what the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister term it as Amrit Call. And as part of this Amrit Call of the 25 years span, this is the first one of that budget. And towards that, there are various you know, drivers which have been enshrined as part of this budget. They called it as uh, Saptarishi, they called it at uh, different uh, names. But what essentially uh, they are trying to achieve is they are trying to accelerate, they are trying to, uh, you know, uh, provide uh, the acceleration to the economy leading towards the 100 year completion uh, for the uh, independent India by 2047. As part of that, the first step is this year's budget. Uh, the first year happens to be this year budget. And of course, this year budget, most of us would have gone through understood. Basically, uh, there will be nothing which you will see as earth shattering because this is only one of the chain in the link of long term strategy the government evolved few years back. 
whether it is Gati Shakti, whether it is National Mobility Mission, whether it is electronics, digitalization, whether it is uh, you know EV policy, climate change. So all of these, which the government set out a few years back as a medium to long term focus, is is all contained in this year budget also. Similarly, the ba the basic construct of this government happens to be that they would like the economy to be propelled by uh, more expenditure from the capital side of the budget, capital expenditure side of the budget. So towards that end, of course, we have seen a lot of uh, prime pumping happening in the past as well. But this year also, uh, there is a 33% outlay uh, growth outlay for capital expenditure being allocated, uh, taking uh, the total expenditure on capital for FI24 to be 10 lakh crores. Uh, there are several, several schemes. I'm not going to talk about all of those, but essentially it is a capital led uh, path breaking new age kind of a budget for the future uh, rather than, uh, you know, uh, the traditional budget, which we have seen uh, in the past, uh, you know, few years back. And uh, some of the uh, data points which we have seen in the budget as part of uh, deep dive analysis is fiscal deficit is one particular aspect, uh, you know, which was the most worrisome post pandemic, uh, where it went out of completely control in FI23. Uh, it was supposed to be reined in to 6.4% of the GDP. And I, I think they are well on target to do that. So FI23, we will close the fiscal defi deficit with a GDP a percentage with GDP of 6.4. But uh, interestingly, the budget had also talked about uh, a glide path taking us to a fiscal deficit of 4.6% to GDP by FI2026, which essentially means uh, what we are going to do in a calibrated manner in the next three years to take us to 4.6% to GDP uh, uh, is FI24, the projected fiscal deficit is 59 uh, which is 0.5% less than the current year. And FI25 will be 5.2% and taking us FI26 to 4.6. Essentially, what it means is that next three years, it is going to be pretty stiff in terms of, uh, you know, uh, expenditure itself uh, and also on revenue uh, increase. Uh, we have to ensure that the fiscal deficit is re reined. And we are not talking about what uh, as, a, as a medium term and long term strategy to keep the fiscal deficit at 3%. We are talking about taking the fiscal deficit to 4.6% itself is going to be a, a Herculean task for us in the next three years. And that is going to come with a lot of pain because there's going to be a lot of uh, you know pruning on expenditure. And towards that, in fact, this year, FI24, we have seen the revenue expenditure itself is only to, going to grow at 1.2% as against the capital expenditure, which I talked about. So it's very credible on the part of the government to say that they are going to cut down on the revenue expenditure because it's not going to have any multiplier effect on the economy and they are going to look at the uh, uh, revenue expenditure uh, very, very uh, 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 shallow growth of 1.2%. So there are good things which we are noticing, but essentially next three years is going to be very tough for us in terms of containing the physical deficit towards 4.6 uh, by, by the year FI26. Inflation is of course, one a big, big point because of which, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of monetary policy changes which are happening. Repo rate has been raised uh, day before yesterday uh, to 6.5% uh, uh, in the recent uh, monetary policy committee. Basically there, uh, if you look at uh, financially at 2023, we are going to uh, end uh, in the, with an inflation rate of around 6.5, 6.6%. And the projected one for financial 24, is 5.3 or 5.4 percent. Uh, that's the that's the expectation. And somewhere in the budget, what had happened is typically we all look at the growth rate in the budget, but budget really didn't talk about the uh, real growth rate. They talked about somewhere uh, the nominal growth, which was talked about uh, at a rate of 10.5 percent to GDC GDP. And with the adjustment for inflation, we are talking about close to about 5.2, 5.3 percent as the growth rate for financial year 24, which is quite surprising because uh, while we were expecting on the top of 6.1% growth rate for financial 23 closure, we were expecting it to be somewhere around six because even uh, the World Bank had projected a 6.6% uh, growth rate and IMF has projected a 61 
to look at uh, the growth rate at somewhere around 5.2, 5.3% for FI24, that's quite uh, very, very modest, I would say. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the growth rate is quite uh, lowly pegged for FI24, and there is uh, quite a, a good room for them to, maybe they, they want to factor in the external uh, environment uh, with which the globe is operating, even Globally, the growth rate is expected to uh, do in FI24 around 2.9%. So, with all these things, uh, the budget looked a lot more credible uh, in the sense the numbers are quite conservative, so to speak. On the tax growth perspective itself, because tax contributes a major chunk of the uh, revenue receipts for the government, the tax growth uh, for 22-23, uh, FI23 is about 17.2% uh, from the direct tax standpoint, and it is expected to be 10.5% only uh, for FI24. So direct tax is going to be uh, moderating on uh, revenue growth uh, in the year FI2024. And IDT, the, basically the GST and the other indirect taxes, customs put together. FI23, we saw a growth rate of 7.1%, which is not great, and we will have a growth rate of 10.4%. So the government is betting on largely on indirect tax growth rate for FI24 as compared to direct tax. And out of the indirect tax, two specific taxes where they are focusing on is union exchange duty and customs duty. Union exchange duty is going to grow at 5.9% as compared to the current year, which degrew at 18.9%, as well as customs, which will grow from 5.1 to 11%. So a lot of action are expected to happen around union excise duty and customs. And uh, overall, as tax as a percentage of GDP is going to remain the same, it is going to be around 11.1%, both in FI23 and FI24. So why I'm reeling out all these statistics is to uh, convey the message that in terms of buoyancy of tax growth to uh, as compared to economic uh, growth, uh, it is going to be moving from 0.8 to 1% uh, in the coming year, uh, which, which is going to convey a message that tax is going to be prime driver to, for the revenue to grow. And uh, of course, with the growth being projected low, uh, the uh, tax to GDP growth is also going to be remaining the same. So towards that end, even the uh, revenue secretary, uh, the finance secretary has acknowledged that the growth in tax rate is quite modestly uh, projected for FI24. So uh, essentially, uh, in fact, uh, one thing which went unnoticed anywhere is this windfall tax. Windfall tax is something which is part of union uh, excise duty. This windfall tax has been slapped uh, during the course of financial year uh, 23 on uh, windfall which accrued to uh, you know uh, crude product uh, producers in the country, defenders in the country because Suddenly, the, the, uh, the crude prices went up in the international market because of that, uh, you know, uh, windfall profits were enjoyed. It's not income tax. It's an indirect tax where they have raised the uh, in excise duty. And close to about 25,000 crore has been mopped up, is expected to be mopped up, arising out of windfall tax alone uh, in the FI23. So there are very innovative things being done. There are some credible numbers which we have seen. And economic survey projected that we are going to go have the drivers in the form of stable and healthy financial system and through digitalization and diversification of global uh, supply chain through incentive schemes like production linked incentive. So this is the backdrop I would just wanted to highlight uh, as part of my opening remark and now I would like to hand it over to Dr. Samandam to take it forward. Over to you Dr. Samandam. Dr. Samandam if you are there. Uh, Sarinya, Dr. Samandam is there? Uh, yes, sir, he's there. Okay. If you can ping him and request him to. Otherwise, maybe Sudha Mayapan can start and then Dr. Samandam can come later if she's around. Uh, let's give him a few minutes because he got disconnected. He's connecting back. Oh, 
Oh, uh, sir, he is just disconnecting and uh, getting logging in, sir. Please. Yeah. Uh, sorry, any luck? Uh, sir, please, uh, sir, I requested to, uh, like, you know, uh, take... It's okay now, Sudha. Sudha, you should uh, go ahead now yeah. to my mic. Should I? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Let him come back and talk uh, after. I would like <laughs> to share the presentation if it's possible. I think I have issues connecting the MacBook with the uh, system to share the presentation. Sharanya, I have shared it with you on WhatsApp. Would it be possible for you to share it? Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, anyhow, so since uh, people are there, uh, so essentially, uh, while well, I've, I've just uh, laid out the overall scenario uh, leading to the tax uh, uh, numbers uh, basically uh, in terms of uh, even the tax proposals uh, uh, obviously uh, what was expected out of this budget was more from the point of so once uh, you are ready let me know i'm just filling it up uh, i am ready i'm just waiting for sharanya to share the presentation yes, sir. yeah, yeah. Well, Dr. Some of them are joined. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's joined. Everybody. I think he should go first then. Yeah, good evening, yeah. everybody. I'm sorry I'm uh, not visible because my laptop is not working and I'm logging in through my, I've logged in through my phone. Looks like yeah. I'm not talking. But anyway, all, all, all good because uh, I think we're also waiting for Sudha to, Sudha's um, flights to get ready. Welcome, everybody. My apologies. No, my apologies for the delay. Thank you for joining this. Uh, thank you for joining this evening. For uh, as Sriram was saying before, I got disconnected. A uh, very detailed, a very detailed discussion of the budget, the annual statement of finance, as they would call it, in constitutional terms, presented by the Honorable Finance Minister. Mrs. Nirmala Sitharaman a couple of earlier this month. La, uh, yeah. So la, late last month, rather. It was preceded by the uh, economic survey, which we would have hopefully gone through. I feel guilty. But I would like to just keep it very short uh, behind, uh, and say we don't uh, have to go in. I would not be going into the details of either the economic structure of the budget which I will leave to Sudha, and uh, nor would I go into the details of the taxes, which I would leave to our taxation experts. Generally, looking at it, the annual financial statement, which is a constitutional term for it, uh, comes as a policy statement of the government with regards to what it does, what it intends to do, and for whom it intends to do, and how it intends to do that. We must understand also that the annual statement of finance is the interest is the only point where hardcore economics and hardcore finance 
interact with each other. It is the cross, or it is the point in which these two touch, which is why we, we should also be wary and careful and th thoughtful about whom we vote in, for what political purpose they stand. With that as a background, I would also like to flag just one larger underlying theme of the annual financial statement, which is that it tends in economic policy there is either demand side push or supply side push. The demand side push would give would empower the citizens of the country to create demand directly. The supply side economics, on the other hand, which was uh, largely the outcome of American economic thought, is that we create enabling environments and allow the effects of this policy to quote unquote trickle down. This is not something new to India. We've had this in the past, in terms of major infrastructure developments in the first and second five year plans under Jawaharlal Nehru. And then we went into direct interventions, which was largely by state governments. And off late, the uh, in tune with its political ideology, the present government has gone back to supply side economics with a lot of emphasis on capital expenditure. How long it will take to fructify and how well and how much it is going to sink down to the people for development and equity is very important and to watch. I emphasize the need for equity because inequality anywhere is a threat to equality everywhere. Uh, with this very, very few words giving hopefully a larger frame, very broad framework in which the budget has been cast, I now give the floor to Ms. Sudha Mayapin, my colleague and uh, speaker on the budget and finances on behalf of the Economic Affairs Committee. Once again, I thank you very much for everybody. Uh, I thank you very much for joining us. The rules of the game, the house rules would be that each speaker would finish their speech, their presentation, uh, followed by question and answers at the end of the uh, presentation by the speaker. You may raise your hands using the button here or mail the question to uh, one of us, either Saranya or me, and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. Over to you, Siddha. Thank you. Once, um... Sharanya shares a screen, it'll be easy for me to. Anyway, yeah, I just want to thank that. everybody. Uh, Mr. Sriram, I think you beautifully gave a good summary and an explanation. So I think I need not speak much now at all. I think you have laid out everything very clearly. But now that I'm here, I'll say a few words. Yes, so now to start with, do you think the supply side interventions really work effectively in an economy like India? Of course it does. Okay. And how do you see this taking shape going forward? No, I think um, they are right in terms of giving push for more consumption that will in turn increase more production, uh, which will drive economic growth. Right. There is there is one sort of um, um, view that it is this this tends to be more in favor of indirect uh, incentives than directly incentivizing and creating demand. Uh, do no, you no. agree with that? Why do you say that? No, no, why do you say that? I think it's as direct as it can be, right? They've reduced the taxes, put more money in hands of people. I'm sorry, I can't see Sharanya's uh, uh, screen presentation. Can I'm just seeing a blank screen. Can I can see only a WhatsApp uh, screen here. I don't know whose it is. Sanya, do you have your presentation? Uh, uh, Sudha, you can you can you can upload it. I have it, but from my Mac to this, it's not allowing me to share it. Oh dear. Okay. Ah, uh, ma'am. Yeah. Ah, uh, ma'am, I couldn't able to like you know uh, share that second uh, PPT which you have sent. Uh, can you just like you know try it, ma'am, from your end? Uh, She's got problem connecting from Mac to PC. Yes, sir. So, can I suggest something? If it's okay, then we should uh, ask the next one to go ahead. No, we'll wait for this because we we'll structure it this way. So, oh, okay. that, so that can go ahead with it. Uh, we'll give her a couple of minutes so she can explain okay. her graphic without the graphic. Right. Sharanya, can you ask someone to help with this? Yes, ma'am. 
because it must be relatively simple. Last time, that's how we did it. Because it's important that we see the frame in which the taxation uh, is done, you know. Uh, the taxation, I think Mr. Suresh is the expert. I, I'm just yeah. giving a macro perspective. So the macro, uh, we can fit it in in the flow. So, the, can you just uh, the WhatsApp to me so that I will try to share the screen? To Mr. Suresh? Yes, sir. I'll yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir, I'll just share, sir. The old one, please don't. It's very incomplete. <laughs> I'll send it to Mr. Suresh. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Meanwhile, there have been some very interesting articles on the budget sector wise. Uh, one thing that I've always been seeing consistently is that uh, the quote unquote low priority given to agriculture. Uh, is that going to be really uh, signifying a shift away from agriculture? Is that what the government wants? Is something we need to look at. And what it means for agro based industries is something which we'll have to watch. And there is an interesting article in the Mint today by Deepak Nayar that talks about uh, issues like supply, supply side economics. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Suresh. Yeah. Can you all see it? I can't see it. No, it's starting to share content now. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you so much. You saved the day, Mr. Suresh. Let's go to Thank the you. next slide. Yeah. So, uh, the budget, I want to present it in context of where we are globally and where the Indian economy is also domestically. Now, this is a very interesting and um, challenging time globally, which the Financial Times very aptly named it as a year of poly crisis the last year. Usually, any one of this crisis would be enough to cause an economic slowdown uh, in most countries, but we had three. In fact, the slowdown in China started much before the pandemic. China was already going through a lot of structural shifts, which would have ramifications globally. Now we have changing structure in China, plus a war that nobody anticipated and a pandemic, of course, mm -hmm. causing a lot of disruption. Now, when you add any domestic factor to this, if the domestic um, institutions are weaker, or if an economy is witnessing extreme weather, say in terms of an earthquake, which we recently saw in Turkey, or floods as in Pakistan, then there is challenges economically, which manifold to what is already happening globally. So it's a very tough time if either one of these happens, either domestically or globally, but put together, you have all of this, country risk of any economy only increases dramatically. Now, this is where it is in terms of the whole scenario globally. Next slide, please. Now, where is the impact? Now, the impact of this on most economies. Mr. Suresh, next slide. Okay. The impact, you will see it in the next slide. I have put targets of uh, where the growth rate is going to be globally, which is much slower. Most of the mature economies or emerging economies are going to have economic slowdown, if not recession. And also, the role of trade, global trade, majority driving economic growth is also going to reduce because the volume of, not this, the one before, because the volume of international trade is also going to reduce this year. So one major growth. Can we move to that slide before? Is it possible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, this, one? this one. Yes, this one. So you, as you can see, uh, the global growth rate is going to reduce. And also the share of and also the share of global trade is also going to decrease. Now these two are big propellers of growth. If the mature economies grow at a faster rate, it also helps emerging economies who are their trading partners and trade itself is slowing. So this is a very challenging time. On top of this, most of the economies, especially so the United States, is increasing their policy rates or the Fed rates. 
What does this mean? Is the US dollar is getting stronger, so capital outflow out of the emerging economies into the US is much stronger at this point. Now, while this is the global scenario, where is India fitting in in terms of its political situation? Next slide, you will see that the political risk ratings, which the World Bank comes up with every year, has been improving for India. Can you move to the next one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this one. Uh, the leftmost one, which is the political risk rating, has been decreasing. In fact, uh, it doesn't show very clearly on this graph, which is normalized, and I'm sharing it from my previous organization's uh, TAC Economics, for whom I'm very grateful for giving me a lot of charts, especially my boss from there, Mr. Vivya Maso. Um, you can see that since Modi government came in in 2014, the political risk ratings have gradually improved. That is, the risk has decreased. One of the spaces where it has decreased the most is political stability. But what still remains a huge issue is control of corruption and also the rule of law, which are still very risky and highly uh, placed in terms of rating. But overall, the perception of India's political risk is quite contained and in fact improving. At the same time, again, I've taken the uh, ease of business also from 2014 since the, this government has been in power. It has improved, but you as MSMEs would know better how easy it is to do business than World Bank with its ratings can tell. So a lot of paperwork has reduced, but some challenges still remain, I'm sure. But these two graphs present to you how the international uh, investors or countries view India in terms of its ease of business or political activity, which is quite favorable is what I'm trying to tell. Next slide, please. The most important thing, of course, for this for this budget is the election that is coming up next year. So this budget that is coming up now, you have to keep in mind where the global economy is, which is slowing down. India is viewed very favorably. There is an election coming up. Next slide, please. So the budget has to pander to all of this. And where is the Indian economy itself domestically right now? If you look at it in comparison to other either mature economies, where here I have mostly the United States and the bloc of EU and larger emerging economies, India still ranks the highest in terms of where its growth rates outlook stand. Even if you look at globally, uh, Asia is going to have faster or stronger rates. Even in comparison to Asian economies like Malaysia, Thailand, or Indonesia, India still ranks higher in terms of where the growth is. Macroeconomic indicators are very good and stable. India is all has been consistently ranked amongst top five in terms of forex reserves. So if there is any currency depreciation, which there has been consistently, RBI is able to prop up the currency. Other indicators like confidence index or manufacturing index like PMI, all are positive showing very favorable trend both in terms of confidence in the economy and politically and also in terms of manufacturing so everything is looking good at this time so when the political economy is stable viewed in a very positive manner globally the indicators are positive once again domestically now where is the government going to focus in the budget which is the next slide please if you look at the Oh, yes, I forgot that this slide exists. Also, the big risk factor, which Mr. Sriram was also mentioning, the high inflation rate, the RBI, with its very credible policies, has been consistently increasing policy rates. And inflation, we all feel the pinch of increase in prices. So to quote a figure and say the uh, prices are coming down would seem very redundant to, an, you know, to a layman. But economically, it makes sense the inflation rate is coming closer to the RBI's upper bound. There's a lot of credibility even from the monetary side. There is a good credibility for the RBI also. Next slide. Now here, this is an interesting graph for you to see what drives the Indian economy's growth. Now I told you uh, a while ago, the first slide, that global trade is slowing, uh, emerging mature economies, a lot of them are slowing, if not a recession, right? Now, India, in terms of global trade, is a very small player, unlike China, which is a huge player. So if there is a slowdown in the trade, it is not dramatically going to affect India's economy. 
in fact manufacturing itself not global trade manufacturing itself is usually between 50 to 15 to 17 percent of the gdp share of gdp so it's not too high even trade is a very small part of in fact we have we are high commodity importers so our net trade is much lower we don't export so much so the fact that the global trade is reducing is not going to affect indian economy steeply or greatly what drives the propelling factor of indian economy is the domestic consumption what is the spending that is private consumption in the economy if you look at this graph the blue bar shows uh, the share of private consumption which is usually 60 percent of the gdp right and then investments or uh, uh, capital formation is also a significant part of what drives the gdp now with this as a strength the government very rightfully in this budget is focusing on giving boost to these two factors and not working too much on say exports or manufacturing which it is already doing in terms of made in india and other policies but this budget specifically is giving a boost in the arm especially for these two growth drivers which is going to take the economy forward next slide please Great. So a lot of money, right? So you have more money in hands, the more one spends, the more demand there is, like the forward-looking indicators of retail sales or automobile sales are high. Now, with uh, this will be Mr. Suresh's forte as to how much money there will be in people's hands with all the tax uh, cuts, this will give more opportunity for people to spend, hence there will be more production, there will be job creation and the economy will grow. That is the idea for putting more money in the hands of people, also spending more money in terms of investment. Now, the numbers, of course, everybody can look up online. I have just stated in the presentation for you to see. But what the government essentially is doing is it's building infrastructure that is going to support growth, building airports, building roads, building all sorts of infrastructure which will not just provide jobs while creating this infrastructure but will support economic growth in terms of subsidy there is a reduction in marginal reduction in subsidy like 28 percent is not that marginal because they have reduced the pandemic support of food and fertilizer that increased during covid now that has been reduced so just because it's the election year not a lot of freebies have not been distributed but there has been who needs the money low income most necessary are getting food subsidies but the pandemic subsidies have been reduced there is more investment there is more money in the hands of people with a reduction in taxation so all this which i showed you before will propel domestic growth and investment hence relating to job creation and production okay? this is the idea for the budget next slide please now now uh, okay where is the money going to come from all of you uh, are very well versed with how the economy works or the various aspects of it but just to make it a little bit much more simpler um, i'll just give the analogy of if if you take the example of a household and say you're borrowing money say from a bank uh, if you put it in your business if the business is already doing well like how the indian economy is already doing well so if you borrow money put it in the business that is already doing well. The idea is the business will grow, hence your income or profit will grow. You'll be able to repay the loan back and improve your business, right? But if you borrow the money from bank and spend it on giving it to a relative who is very poor, which is your subsidies, or you spend it on some other social obligation, then your business is not growing. So the government is taking this money it has to go into public borrowing to fund its infrastructure plans. So our public debt is already high, although it is on a reducing margin, reducing trend. At 83%, it is already quite high. But in spite of this, the, bo the borrowings that the government is going to undertake, or it's already been undertaking, it is only going to fuel economic growth further. So as long as the economic growth is going to grow at a faster rate than a fiscal deficit or the market borrowing, we are safe in borrowing. So as long as I'm borrowing from the bank and I'm using it to the business which is growing, I'm safe. I can repay the loan. But only when I borrow and my business tanks, then I'll not be able to repay, which is not going to be the case with India right now at least. So the inflation rate is going to come down 
the policy rates are going to be sufficiently high to be attractive for foreign investors or Indian investors to invest. Uh, the risk of inflation will be re reduced. The growth is going to be higher than fiscal deficit and the fiscal deficit is also going to reduce. So overall, they have through this budget, they have managed to strike the balance for growth, for fiscal consolidation and sustainability and good institutions where they have hit the right balance in terms of monetary policy also. That is, of course, outside of the budget. Next slide, please. So, well, it's a game well played. Uh, so, as I said, the budget has mainly played to its strengths, right, of propelling domestic consumption, which is already good, and investments that is going to give you more jobs. Now, India is a country of paradox, which we all already know. Uh, as I mentioned here, that while there is such a push for digital growth, um, there is almost 6% of the population that does not have safe drinking water. The government talks about building extraordinarily strong digital growth while it's also building toilets. So look at the contrast. So some of the indicators in terms of social development are comparable to some of the poorest countries in the world and advancements can be compared to one of the most mature economies. So it's a country of paradox. Lot of structural shifts have to happen, which of course this budget cannot fix. Also, trade, which is such a big, uh, almost like an Achilles heel for a country of this size, highly protect, protective uh, in terms of for the domestic industry, which maybe you as an industry would agree with, but it's not helping the cause of the economy to grow as fast as it can grow. So I quote here a statistic of how little, by 700 billion, India is losing out on its trade uh, because of its restrictive policy. So a lot can be done, a lot has to be done, but the budget does what it should do at its right time, but challenges remain. Now, one key takeaway is because it didn't go for any um, risky and counterintuitive to market policies, it's very safe for all of us to assume that the same government will continue next year, right? And when they do, they have an opportunity to work on the weaknesses that I just mentioned only hoping that they don't do any bolder policies uh, like demonetization that are completely unnecessary and uh, detrimental to the economy. So there's a huge chance here which should not be squandered away in the future, but for now, it's well played budget. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sudha. I liked in particular the very detailed and nuanced presentation behind every little aspect. Um, in passing, I must mention, I must draw attention to Sudha's last slide, which is still on, which shows India's strength directly in cricket and the emerging strength in women's cricket. May I just ask you, Sudha, what does uh, the budget do for women? Well, you know, specifically, there are a lot of policies that they announced, right, in terms of credit, uh, smaller credit to women, microfinance. Uh, but in terms of health and education, a lot of work needs to be done. So that's what I'm saying. There is a spending that is going mostly into infrastructure, which is great, but a lot of spending also has to happen in terms of education, skills development. So you cannot segregate that as a gender issue, uh, but also an issue that needs to be addressed. And I'm sure it will be focused in other policies that the government would come up with. But that is also one of the building blocks for a nation uh, to have a strong education and health policy. And this budget didn't address both much at all. I mean, there is a lot of push on digital education and some Ekalavya schools. I was very surprised with the term Ekalavya school because Ekalavya didn't have a teacher. So I don't know, it was a little uh, misnomer about how a school would not have a teacher. Mm -hmm. Whatever, yeah. But yeah, nothing very specifically to gender, but to growth, which will raising tide right, raises all boats. Hopefully right. for women also. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, please? I have got, not got any. And I want to thank Mr. Suresh from not just being a stellar presenter on direct taxes. You helped me with the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Suresh. Huh. Thank you. Anyone with questions for Sudha? Let me see the chat box. There's nothing here. 
if there is nothing more for Sida, we could wait for some more time. The best is always for the tax. I'm also very curious to listen yes. to Mr. Suresh. I don't uh, think we should wait. Yes, time. linking up from Sida's presentation to the direct taxes first, um, normally there would be a, a higher exemption rate for women. I don't know if I've missed it, but there seems to be um, a talk about the new tax regime and the low, low, uh, old tax regime. Uh, but there are a lot, a lot of doubts. Primarily, will what do what do the two mean? And will it, to take from Sudha again will really mean a lot of more money in the hands of the people? Over to you, Suresh. Can you please switch on your video if you'd like to? Yeah, yeah, sure. So thank you, Samadhi. Thank you, Sridham. Uh, thank you, Sridham. It's always a uh, pleasure listening to you, uh, as well as uh, Sridham and Samadhi. So you are definitely making my job a little bit tougher. With uh, because so when you have a very strong opening start, so you know, like the middle order, uh, you know, suddenly don't know what to do, so whether to continue hitting or stabilize. Uh, Anyhow, Mr. So, Suresh, but, that is being say, very humble. You are the star batsman here. I would suggest you go on. I would suggest continue hitting. Go for it. <laughs> but, so, uh, so, is the video visible? Or is there a yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, you are. Thank you. Yeah. So, presentation also there, no? Yes. But, so, uh, again, you know, like uh, the finance minister spoke for around 15 20 minutes she said the best part of uh, the budget is the tax and what all of you are waiting for uh, but however when you go to the fine prints of the finance bill there were close to 122 changes were there uh, including the two which is the short title the tax rates uh, which is quite, quite a remarkable number uh, so 122 is not a small number so five insertions 112 Amendments, one emission, and substitutions has been a phenomenal number. Uh, but anyhow, so I definitely, uh, I'm sure some of you are already feeling, no, it's going to be all went right. Definitely not. We'll stick on to what is going to be uh, relevant for so most of us here. So because some of them are going to be too technical, uh, maybe required more for the professionals, not from the point of view of uh, many of you here. So. So always there is an expectation uh, before the budget. Uh, so this is a very common man's question. So will my standard action go up? Will my basic exception will go up? So what will happen to the surcharge? What will happen to this? Will there be a, some more says already we have health and education. Will there be a COVID says or non-COVID says? So what will happen to my ETC or uh, blah, blah, blah. So many questions are there. In fact, uh, uh, before the budget, and I think uh, I really like with the recent uh, A.R. Rahman song, which uh, summarizes quickly uh, as to what people think on January 31st, because there's always a power, a power, a power, there's a kind of expectation. So I think Rahman has set a tone for maybe it can be a budget song uh, from the next year onwards for some more time. So that's a kind of a power, a power, a power, a power, a kind of expectation is always there, a lot of patience. Now, very interestingly, uh, on the budget day in the city, uh, when we are talking to many television channels, so we haven't been talking much about that. When we talked about what you expect from the budget in Siki's point of view, uh, very interestingly, we talked about only few things. That one, uh, the new tax regime will be tweaked. That was the one thing which we talked about. And other than that, we generally tell we don't expect much of a changes on the budget. Uh, it was pretty. Surprising because of the fact that once the budget is over, precisely what the finance minister was talked about, there was not much of a change from the point of view of most of the people, except for the change in the uh, new tax rate. There's no change in the old tax regime, as all of us know, except for a small change in the surcharge. Uh, they just kept it simple uh, to a larger extent. I think we are trying to move to a slightly different regime, so whereby uh, we will have to forego the exemption, so we may have to. Uh, live with limited exemption. Uh, and what the government's thought process now is that I will give more money to you in your hand. It is for you to decide how you want to put the money to use. You want to consume, 
can give. So you want to save, save. You want to invest, anything you do, that's not a proud. From my point of view, what I want to do is keep your tax complaints simpler, tax complaints easier. And I don't want too many litigations. I just want to collect the tax in the simplest way possible. That's that, that's the way in which uh, the message seems to be. I, in fact, I was listening to the finance minister uh, in CNBC also. She was echoing this particular point because it's not our responsibility uh, to decide or tax should not be the influencer for making your investment choices. That, that's the clear message. Just to sum up what we already said, there's no change in the tax rate except for the new tax regime. The surcharge for the income above 5 crores uh, reduced to 25% from the present 37%, so which effectively brought down the last lab rate from 42.84% to 39%. And there's no change in the savings limit like ATC, ATD for the reasons which I have already mentioned. One thing which uh, many people missed out, which is not even I think talked about was uh, 80G, which is a uh, deduction available for donations. It's not available for three donations, it has been removed, uh, which is Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Fund, Indira Gandhi Memorial Trust, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi Foundation. Uh, and interestingly, the reason given for this was only out of so many donations which are eligible, only these three donations have the name of some person. So therefore, the government said, okay, uh, with all other sections not talking about any particular name, they will be prime minister, chief minister, national defense type of the thing will be there. So only three donations have a name of some particular person, and therefore we decided to remove those three donations. So it is a very interesting uh, change, which uh, uh, relatively get unnoticed. So, uh, so moving on to the first of my discussion or the major discussion, the new tax regime, which was much talked about. Uh, so, two things what the finance minister is talking about was uh, up to seven lakhs, you don't have to pay tax if you are in a tax regime. Uh, and the number of slab rate in the new tax regime was actually brought down by one. Uh, so, all of you already know under the present new tax regime, uh, the limit was two and a half lakhs. First two and a half lakhs zero. Then the rough rate was every two and a half lakhs. You had a five percent, five percent gap, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, up to two point five zero, next two point five, next two point five, and so on. So there is a small modification what was done here. Instead of two point five lakhs gap, uh, that gap was now made as three lakhs each. So first three lakhs zero, next three lakhs five percent, next three lakhs ten percent, next three lakhs fifteen percent. Uh, likewise, they made a change. What do you think of that? The uh, 20 to 30 was a direct jump, like what we had in the old tax. There was no 25% now. And very interestingly, the standard deduction, which was not available in the new tax regime up to uh, last year, it was also made available to new tax regime also. So that means if, it, if you're a salary clause, and for a salary income up to seven and a half lakhs, your tax becomes zero. Uh, I think was uh, Sudha was also mentioning it's a phenomenal decision because uh, seven and a half lakhs translates into sixty two thousand five hundred rupees per month. So somebody having a salary income of sixty two thousand five hundred per month may not have to pay any tax. I think it's definitely a very very uh, great move, and that means that you are putting more money uh, in the hands of the people. And of course, the most important point of it is there is no deductions available. So therefore, it's a very, very simple tax structure. With 62,000 no tax, I think it's a, a great initiative from the branch minister. To facilitate this, they've changed the uh, 87A, which provides for tax rebate. So which from the present limit of 12,500 increased to 25,000 or increased to 20,000 only if you are going to offer new tax regime. That means if you want to continue with the older tax regime, you will continue to get 12,500 of rebate and and your exemption uh, the uh, total income limit will continue to remain as 5 lakhs only. So that means a clear message that you have to go to new tax regime if you want to avail this extended benefit. So uh, just for the, uh, uh, before we go to an interesting comparison, so this is what finally we have now. Uh, old tax regime, no change. First two and a half lakhs zero. Next two and a half lakhs five percent. Next five lakhs twenty percent. Thereafter thirty percent. 
present existing tax claim, which I already mentioned, you have a nil 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 with the 5% gap for every two and a half lakhs. Obviously, when I make the 2.5 to 3 and the gap also to 3, one slab rate I have to cut. So up to 3, 3 to 6, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, 12 to 15, and above 15. Uh, the only difference, as I mentioned, is there is no 22% slab. So after 20, you move to 30% slab. So obviously, you can make a calculation. How did they get the number of 25,000 of rebate? So first 3 lakhs, 0. 3 to 6 lakhs. That gap is 3 lakhs. 5% of that will come to 15,000. 6 lakhs to 9 lakhs. Take that 1 lakh. 10% of 1 lakh is 10,000. Add to that 15,000 between 3 to 6 lakhs, 25,000. That is how the max works. Up to 7 lakhs, you will make a 0 tax. So that's the mathematics between 87, 8, 7 lakhs and 25,000. So this might give you an impression that you can claim a rebate under 87A only if you are paying tax under the normal slab rate. Uh, you, uh, some of you may be aware of uh, some of your incomes, like your capital gains, uh, if it is a short term capital gains, it's getting taxed at 15% provided you have sold it in the stock exchange. Uh, similarly, a long term capital gains, if you sell in the stock exchange, attracts 10% tax in excess of 1 lakh. Uh, suppose if you get some lottery or any online gaming which is now going to be taxed, you have to pay 30% tax. Other than listed shares, if you have a capital gains, uh, that will be subject to a 20% tax. Now, interestingly, the rebate under 87A is available for those incomes also. There is no prohibition as such. The number, the max might suggest it is available only for income taxable under the normal range. But however, when you go into the section, you find except for 112A, which is nothing but long-term cap gains on sale of your listed shares or equity-oriented fund, which attracts 10% tax in excess of 1 lakh. Only for that capital gains, you don't get the tax rebate under 87A. All other income are eligible for tax rebate also. Of course, for the last 10 days, one question many people are asking us, is should I have to go for old tax regime? Should I have to go for new tax regime? This is always a question. It's a very difficult question to answer, but what we can only do in the whole uh, this thing is that what we can do one thing. So what we can do is we can just find out uh, what should be your direction. See, one point you must understand, what are the directions which are available exclusively in the old tax regime, which is very important. So once you know that what is the directions available under the old tax regime, the next question will be how much that should number be is what we can have. We can, I, I can just call it as a bit of an indifference point is what I can call. So that indifference point as a concept is what we can work towards it. Uh, I hope this Excel file is visible to you. Oh, or is only the PowerPoint of it? Uh, Mr. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Yeah. Suresh, you can perhaps the side panel, it may be more visible for everybody. And the key or slide, the use for now. That one yeah. which we used for Sudha's presentation, you can collapse the uh, side panel and just stick to the main thing. I think more. Uh, but it's good. Keep going on. No problem. That's not a deal breaker. Suresh, you'll have to go and navigate in layout. Yeah, yeah. Now it should be visible now, right? Visible now? Now you are able to see that? The Excel sheet. Yes, yes it's visible now. I request uh, uh, all uh, everybody to readjust your layout so that you can see the thing in full. You can move the slide aside and then you can see the Gra graphic in full. Go to layout and then click on side by side. You'll be able to see and then enable, enable full screen view. We get a better picture. Thank you. So, uh, so basically, what I have done here is that instead of trying to suggest you uh, whether you should go for the older view, uh, a simple methodology which can be adopted is so these are the list of reductions which I've zeroed on which are available uh, under the old tax regime vis a vis uh, the new tax regime. At house rent elements, interest on your housing loan, uh, ADC, ADD, DDG, 
GTTTTTTTB. I'm, I'm talking about the most popular, not going to line by line. So these are the ones which are most commonly used. Uh, arrive at this total, right? So now, if your income is 6 lakhs, uh, then your reduction has to be 1 lakh. Of course, up to 7 lakhs, I don't even suggest you to think of old tax regime. Because in any case, up to 7 lakhs, and if you're a salary plus up to 7.5 lakhs, uh, you can simply go for a new tax regime. And if you're a salary plus, there is no problem because year on year options are available. So that's not a problem at all. Uh, take, for example, if your income is 8 lakhs, uh, this list, if it is going to be a 1 lakh 87,000 fine, that is your exemption on account of HRA or interest on housing law or ATC, ATT put together. If this amount is going to be more than 1 lakh 87,500, then you can go for old tax rating. So that means effectively what this particular Excel sheet will suggest up to 187,500 is the indifference point, the cutoff point between the two. Or if you are above 1 lakh 87,500, you should continue with the old tax regime. If your reductions are account of the nine listed above, or five set is nine, this nine are very common. Um, so these are by and large what 99% of the people will have. Let's not go to the exceptions. So we may have a few exceptions. Uh, maybe some people might even have additional 50,000 at the ATCCD. So I'm just not going into the exact number, but by and large, uh, I'm trying to take the most used number. Uh, the simple way of looking at this case, this number is going to cross 187,500, stay with the old tax regime. And if your income is 9 lakhs, that is 237,500. So if it is going to be 10 lakhs, it's going to be 265. So that's how it's more easier for you to work like this, to find out how much should be my deductions for me to move to the other scheme, rather than trying to find out and go to any consultant, ask the question or go to many uh, websites which are saying that come here, we'll do the calculator, all this stuff. I, I don't think that way we can approach. You have to be a little bit dynamic. Uh, we can give the cutoff point and that will be a answer. But once you're going to cross 15 lakhs, there is no issue at all. The cutoff point is going to remain as 3 lakhs, 75,000. So uh, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, but however, the only challenge which I find in the new tax regime, uh, the most important, the most important uh, challenge which is uh, going to uh, be there in the new tax regime. In fact, uh, I thought even putting this question to uh, Sam and uh, some other ones also, because how much India's savings to GDP has been coming down over the years uh, is something which has a very, could be a very interesting data point. Now, the only problem here is that that is going to become a little bit compounded now, uh, because uh, in my uh, cases, I say if I, when I tell my client, uh, so today is approximately, now, now look at the time, it's around 6 o'clock, suppose if a client comes in, uh, this is the time we are talking about life insurance and so on and so forth. If I talk to my client and say that, look, take an LIC policy, if something happens to you and uh, unforeseen circumstances, the family at least financially gets the security. So the moment I say this, there will be a bit of silence in the room and I can find a small tears coming in. It's a Friday evening, as my blood holding up. It's an emotion. And out of this emotion, sometimes comes back and says, now why should I bother about, about my family once I'm not there? That kind of, that's not maybe intended. But sometimes that's a kind of reaction we generally find. But however, if I tell him, in fact, I, I don't I, I don't think even he will think in terms of that. But if I go and tell him that if you take an LIC policy, you will save X amount of tax, then he's that is even a very question. Thanks. I know that some of my friends and known people I don't want to take health insurance for a very simple reason. They feel up to last year I don't have a health insurance. Now, if I'm going to have a health insurance now, there is some sentiment. It's not all quite surprising, you know, like uh, even uh, the big actors, uh, they want to release particular film of regular. They take the recent films, which are supposed to release only on uh, 13th first. It was moved to 12th and uh, it moved to, was moved to 11th. Surely on account of sentimental reason, because 
So one of the leading actors says, my film studio is only on a particular day, and therefore they move. Obviously, the other uh, actors should also move to the other day. So this is the kind of sentiment. We are an emotion-driven uh, country, and therefore some people say that health insurance, if I take something, might happen. So, but instead of telling him, if I tell him, to take a health insurance and you get a benefit and the ATD to the extent of, uh, you can save tax to the extent of 7,500 and if you take for your parents, you can save another 50,000 rupees of tax. Uh, no, he doesn't take, he takes health insurance to protect the, in the payment of some uh, health issue or else he saves a lot of money in the cost of his uh, medical bills. It's not the way it works, but instead if I say that you take and you save some tax, he takes, I'm not saying it is a right, but still, uh, the insurance industry is still a long, long way to go. Uh, even in, uh, if we disappoint in the cities, you can visualize in the case of Tai and Tai Tu cities, and where India still lives in villages. The penetration levels are pretty low, the awareness levels are pretty low, or it becomes a little bit emotional. So, therefore, one way of always trying to make them move towards is show tax as a one way of trying to put the safety. Uh, many people have taken additional 50,000 under the National Pension Scheme under ATCCD, not because of anything else. It saves them around 15,000 rupees plus of tax. So, therefore, it is very difficult to disconnect tax and investment habits. Uh, that is something, I'm not saying that is right from the point of the people, but that is how we are. Uh, so, under these circumstances, already the uh, savings rate, for example, I remember uh, the beef rate was close to 8.5% tax rates, now moved to 7.1%. Uh, uh, as uh, someone that was talking about what is there in the in this budget for women, uh, first you will be aware of Prime Minister's uh, pet saving scheme uh, for uh, daughters, which was having close to 9% tax rate, but that has also come down dramatically. So therefore, on one side, your interest on savings already coming down. And the tax benefits are also now uh, going to be reduced for investments. So under those circumstances, there could be a very, very important challenge that this could have an impact on the savings, which is already shrinking. Now, what kind of an expenditure opportunity available for me? Uh, so when I was like in my son's age, at best we can only go for a Devi theater or a Shanti theater or a Devi paradise or Anand theaters. And whatever you want to spend, even if you buy some ice cream or popcorn inside, it's not going to take more than 100 rupees for watching a film. But today, all of you know, Tony Warden in a But you know how much you would have spent for watching the two films when you go up with a family of four. That is one one aspect of it. There are a lot of opportunities to spend. And we are definitely living with the generation thanks to added to the COVID this thing. So by and large, more of them seem to be singing, uh, why should I buy a house? Why should I really? I don't know whether I'm going to stay in Chennai or Bangalore or US or anywhere. Now, why should I buy a house, pay AMA for 20 years? At least I'm not able to see, being a teacher myself, I've seen generations, at least I've seen three generations of students attending the classes, if there's a fourth generation. Uh, but I just could find some good radical change. Uh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but surely, I don't think they are thinking too much in terms of, I need to buy a house, I don't know, all those steps are, uh, doesn't seem to be there. So just that the life is to be enjoyed. In fact, I am very surprised some people talk about retiring at the age of 35 which many of us think life begins at 50, but you know, think at retirement at 35. So under these circumstances, I feel if, if you are a parent, I think you have a bigger responsibility because the government very, very clearly says, I want to vote a simple tax regime with limited exemption taxes. I want to reduce litigation and make the tax compliance easier. This is the most crucial point, which was also stated by the finance minister uh, in our entry with one of the television channels. Savings is the responsibility of the respective individual. The common cannot take your responsibility. I can only make your life simpler. I can make your life easier. That's all I can do. Now, why I should think of how much you should save, where you should save, from taxation side, 
You don't have to go to a chartered accountant. Don't go to TG Suresh for filing your tax return. Why you're wasting your time? Go to income tax portal. Make your life simpler. File your return easy. I'll gain more money to you. You decide whether to consume, invest, buy to invest. If that's a very easy. I think definitely government is right in its own spectrum. But in that sense, it has become our responsibility to tell the future generation the importance of savings. We are not, we are a country with the DNA of savings in our hands, but the savings are always influenced by multiple factors, uh, like your ATCs, your ATTs, and a lot of things. And we have for a long, long time lived in the regime of exempt, exempt, exempt. To take a PPF, you get ATC direction. The interest on the PPF is exempt from tax. The amount you receive from PPF is exempt from tax. A very few countries in the world operated in the model of exempt, exempt, exempt. They operate in the model of exempt, exempt, taxable. Uh, but barring the few schemes which are recently introduced, substantially we lived in the world of E, E, E regime. But we are now going to move to a regime where the government says no E at all. We will, in lieu of that, we will give you a very simple tax regime, easy to comply regime, moderate taxes. Don't go to professionals for filing the tax returns. It's going to become a lot more simpler because many of the benefits are taken. Therefore, interpretation issues are not going to be there. So that means each one of us should have the responsibility of telling our future generation, first, if you earn 100, this is what you have to save, this is what you available for spending. And this is what, because no longer tax saving instruments are going to get. Just visualize for a moment. We all know that 65% of the population are under 35, 50% of the population are under 25. That so many people are going to enter the job market. And I don't think everyone is going to start with one lakh per month. Most of them may start with 40, 50,000 rupees per month. And for that 40,000, 50,000 rupees per month, today you have a zero tax. Up to 60,000 zero tax. That means in the first three, four years of his job, there is no requirement for him to save, for him to reduce the tax, which rightly or wrongly was acting as an incentive. That means if the first four, five years, if you're not going to have an habit of saving, Habit never dies. All of us know that. And therefore, you might subsequently go to a scheme where the savings could shrink. So I think that is something which is one area where uh, we have a responsibility as we are on the other side of us. We have all, I mean, at least I'm, and I can speak to Sri Ram, we have a couple of people here who definitely are in the 50s. I think we have the responsibility to play here. The government is very clear that that's what we want to play. Our role is clear. And of course, and that means we have a great responsibility to educate our future generation importance of savings, which is the only deterrent in this new tax regime. Uh, so I tax individuals. I'll, I'll go to my second aspect of it, high net worth individuals. So the HNIs were very happy when the finance minister made an announcement that we are going to reduce your surcharge of income above by crores to 39%, effectively almost, it's a close to 4% reduction. So this is a headline news. Uh, I think many HNI would have been very happy to see this. I think they should be. But however, there are certain proposals in this particular budget which targets them differently. Couple of them, suppose uh, for those who are familiar with, if you sell a house and buy a house, you won't have to pay capital gains tax on the same, so which will be 20% and more. Similarly, any other asset, if you are going to buy another house, that also you don't have to pay tax. So what the government says, if your reinvestment for such purpose is going to be about 10 crores, he will not consider the amount beyond I'll go to the details in the subsequent slides. But the very important point. Secondly, last year, if you are going to have you leave about 2.5 lakhs, they said maturity of it is taxable. So this budget says anything other than you above 5 lakhs, you have to pay tax. 
Similarly, market link debentures, which were enjoying a 10% tax, has now been brought into three times of that. It's going to be 30% plus going to be the tax. So there were these were some of the proposals uh, which definitely may be hurting the high net individuals. So one thing which many people were happy during the demonetization period is that even those people were in front of the bank to extend the notes. There is a common man early. So one equation is that uh, if somebody is happy and somebody is uh, wealthy, uh, what we should try to do is how we can also move towards that rather than think about no, I is wealthy should not be the thought process. But that's a very very important point you must understand. Uh, uh, very interestingly, as uh, Sriram was mentioning, that we are taking some time to analyze the budget proposals. In fact, this was something which uh, uh, it is just uh, uh, even within the last 48 hours, the proposal also we added this. Something which external affairs minister presented in the parliament uh, as late as yesterday. So, where uh, he was sharing about the, the great. HNI migration. Well, for the first time in the last so many years, the data was given from 2011, you find people more than 2 lakhs people. That's the first time it crossed 2 lakhs. 2 lakhs 25,620 people have given up their Indian in 2022 to settle elsewhere. Uh, this was the highest, this is the first time. We have crossed two lakhs number. So if you cumulatively cross, it's more than six lakhs people have gone out of India or at least taken or not taken the citizenship uh, or uh, given up the Indian citizenship the last 10 years or so, which is not a great sign because uh, you allow your people of that means they must be have something and if they are just migrating different countries, or uh, is it a bit of a talent drain? Uh, I'm not saying that tax is the only way, but However, maybe these guys are also thinking that for the amount of tax I'm paying, I'm not saying they're right, but they may be thinking that I'm not getting something in back. Uh, what they are not understanding, tax is not something in there. There's no quid pro quo in tax. But however, given this background, uh, there are a couple of laws were also introduced which possibly forcing them to migrate. Of course, the, uh, some of the proposals like your 10 crore house thing. What is the law relating to capital gains? If you buy a house, one house, by selling a house, your tax is going to be zero. The law is never saying the value of that house to be one crore, two crore, three crores, or five crores. I would be very happy to live in a house of 40 lakhs. But Sidam would like to live in a house with just one or two crores. Somebody else would like to live in a property which is more than five crores or 10 crores. But already there is a cap that you can buy only one house. So if somebody buys a house for 50 crores, uh, they were saying that we know we have the statistics, but unfortunately we have not been given the statistics. Uh, we don't know, we are not able to comment on it. But the only question is, since al already there is a cap of one house, should we have to make this change? That's a very important question. But the government always feels, because we, as I told you right from the beginning, the message here seems to be we should go to a regime with a virtually a no tax or no deductions or no exemption. That, that's what may be a five year plan. Let's have a very, very simple tax, low tax rates with minimum exemptions and deductions. Maybe this could be one step towards that. But however, as I told you, with so many people already giving citizenship, it's a huge number. We cross two lakhs, it's not a great sign. Uh, when two lakhs and more people are giving citizenship move to a different country, of course, uh, the most sought after by big business is US. A lot of people are moving to buy also in recent times. So, so there's something which should also be kept in mind while uh, drafting your tax proposals also. Uh, I think in that sense, we have a couple of proposals in this particular budget. Uh, not saying it is dry away, but maybe it's also one of the reasons which possibly they feel. So uh, let's look at what is the government's reason for this. Our purpose of giving you a no tax for investing in another house is to give impetus to the house building activity. That's why I think 
uh, if the house value is more than 10 crores, will it give impetus to house building activity? Uh, I'm not sure why why that does not give impetus to house building activity. However, it has been observed that claims of huge deductions by high net worth assets give made under these provisions by purchasing very expensive residential houses. It is defeating the very purpose of these sections. Uh, see, the purpose of these sections, my understanding when it was introduced, is that if you sell a house, you should buy a house. That means you have already bought a smaller house. Subsequently, you move to a bigger house also, no problem. You have to pay tax. So long as you sell one house and buy another house, that, that is the idea. The section never contemplated in my reading of income tax for the close to, uh, I'm reading income tax from March 1985. So in another one month's time, uh, I'll be completing uh, 38 years uh, with it. So I have not seen this almost four decades of subject. Uh, every moment of it in the last 38 years, I've been watching. At no point of time, this section was talking about this is meant for low cost housing, this is meant for short. The only thing that is promote housing. That promotion of housing is for low cost, was never there at all. But, however, uh, for the reasons based on this, because I think they should give the, some statistics that this much number of people have used this so that we are playing. The number of people used this is going to be some 100, 150. Uh, I don't think we should even attempt to do this because of the fact. These people are still going to do with the help of high uh, high profile lawyers and chartered accountants. So they may find some way to get out of this. Uh, I think the best course of action would be just leave it as it is because you already have one cap. But nevertheless, the government and own wisdom they feel uh, if you pay more than ten crores, we will give you only up to ten crores of benefit alone in both fifty four and fifty five. But the only catch if you are familiar with fifty four F. 54F provides for a proportionate exemption. Proportionate exemption. That means if my capital gains is 20%, my exemption will also be only 20%. It's not like 54, where your entire capital gains you can save tax. Let's take a simple example. If I have 100 crores of sale value, and if my capital gains is 20, 20 crores, I will get only 20% 20 exemption for my investment. It's not entire 20 crores going to be exempt from tax. That is one small point you must understand. So essentially, if you take this example, you will be in a position to understand what I'm saying. So let us take a house with the sort for 50 crores, land with the sort for 50 crores. Both have a cost adjusted for inflation of 35 crores, which results in a capital gains of 15 crores. Now, if I'm going to buy for 40 crores, out of my sale process of residential house, as my capital gains is 15 crores, I will get exemption only to the extent of 10 crores. So I have put 40 crores of money. I will get only 10 crores as exemption on the balance by crores I have to pay tax. But what about land? When you're going to invest in a residential house out of the sale process of land, the exemption is worked out proportionately. That is, it's got to be on the basis of amount of invest by my consideration into the capital gains. It's proportional. If you take this example, my capital gains proportion is 30%. That means my exemption is only going to be 30% of the amount invested. Now, the one question here, which is pertinent, should I have to calculate 30% of 40 crores and then calculate the 10 crores or my investment value itself is going to be considered one year as 10 crores. That was the very interesting point. But the clarification seemed to be saying 10 crores is the exemption restriction. But the provisions as it found in the finance bill says that 10 crores alone will be considered as your investment in the house. That means if you take this example, if 40 crores is considered as investment, 40 by 15 to 15, 12 crores will be my exemption, restricted to 10. That is how the memorandum seems to be suggesting. But however, if you read the finance bill, it's more simpler. They say that your exemption eligible itself will be considered as 10, then apply the proportion, which means, uh, so if I take in this example, 30% of 10 is what I should take. It's not 30% of 40 restricted 10. Instead, it should be 30% of 10 restricted to 10. So uh, the investment itself is kept, not the exemption amount. That means what is going to happen in this particular case, I will get only 3 crores 
as exemption if i invest 40 crores out of 50 crores of land i will get only 3 crores exemption that means i have invested 80% of my proceeds but whereas my exemptions only going to be 6% 6% of that so this is going to have definitely a lot of real estate companies which had an exposure to uh, large investment in uh, large scale properties will definitely suffer or they will try to sell as much as they can before 31st of March because these provisions are going to be made applicable from assessment year 2024-25. So very interesting move, uh, but I think this is all they are trying to say. Slowly but surely we want to take out your exemptions, whatever we do. So another interesting one, the sick insurance policies with the premiums above 5 lakhs. So as I mentioned earlier also, if you're going to have yearly up to last year's in excess of 2 lakhs was taxed. Now that they're trying to take to any other policy other than unique policy issued on or after 1st April 2023. That means if you buy the policy up to 31st March 2023, no problem at all. Uh, so therefore, if you are planning to uh, use life insurance policy as an investment, as the government always considers life insurance policy should be taken for risk and it should not be considered as an investment after the entry of many foreign insurance companies into india they converted this lac policy into investment rather than protection offers continuous attempts have been made over a period of time by restricting the reduction under atc to uh, ulic policy being taxed in the last year considerable changes have been made. What's the government's view here? If you're selling an insurance policy as an investment, then you pay tax. My benefit which I want to offer from tax is only for an insurance policy which covers the risk of your life and the suffering the family has to undertake if something happens to you. But if you're going to convert that as an investment, other investment products like your shares or mutual funds are going to be taxed. So therefore, pay tax on this also. That is the idea. Uh, my only this thing is that let us not keep this uh, insurance company stocks in turmoil, just like something normally used to happen in the case of ITC, except for the last two years. Because every time ITC price will fall, because always something will be labeled as a thin tax on tobacco consumption or cigarettes and always that shares will tank uh, but luckily that's not been happening for the last uh, couple of budgets there is nothing called sin tax being debit now so every time uh, last few years instead the one which are affected is this insurance company stocks last time because of you this time because of this policy now having clarified your stand regarding how you want to view the insurance policy in one stroke what can be done is say any insurance policy which has the theme of investment will tax pay tax that's all over now why every year just create uncertainty for them our mission is very clear very simple purpose of giving benefits is only for coverage offers not for investment if you want to take insurance life insurance policy as an investment type pay the tax that will be fair enough but however we are moving one by one uh, towards that aspect of it. One more thing is five. But problem here is that this five lakhs limit will apply for aggregate of policies. Suppose you have policy with one insurance company for two lakhs, another insurance company for two lakhs, another insurance company for two lakhs. If you think that you are saved by this mechanism, the answer is no. All the three policies you have to put together and take the limit of five lakhs. But how will how will the other insurance company know? That's the question. So likewise. Uh, uh, there are going to be quite a lot of challenges here, but however, the simple way of looking at it is remove this cap, all the things, just simply come back and say insurance policy other than coverage of risk will be subject to tax simple. In that way, I think it becomes easier. But I think uh, so the industry has sought an appointment with the finance minister. I think they have a few uh, points here. So so one point which they're saying that the insurance industry is still in the nascent stage. Still, India is one country where I'm sure uh, 
Sudan, some of them will have more statistics than what I have. The coverage of health insurance and the life insurance penetration still is very, very low in India. So, of course, there is a huge uh, market is available for us to look at positivity. But however, uh, they need in this particular case, uh, there is a necessity for them uh, to be <clears throat> surviving in the market to cater to the many people who are uncovered. So they feel that these kind of policies generate revenue for them to sustain. So that is what uh, their viewpoint. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. So therefore, uh, these things, according to them, might impact their business model itself. What to say? Therefore, they are suggesting that five lakh limit let it go to ten lakhs at the first point. That is so that in a phased manner they can adjust. Again, another very interesting uh, uh, the thing what is that? So if you say it's an investment product. Cheap tax investment product. So, if I invest in a shares for five years or a mutual fund for five years or six years, and the profits of which are going to be taxed one year as a capital gain. And we all know uh, if it is a long term capital gain that is subject to a tax of 20% after indexation. So, but what this proposal says is this amount you receive on maturity of insurance policy minus the premium paid by you will be taxed as income from other sources, effectively depending upon your tax bracket. The minimum tax could range from 31.2% to as high as 39%. So, uh, therefore, they say uh, the provision should be tweaked to say this should be subject to tax only as a long-term capital gain instead of income from other sources. Therefore, at least that could be a savings in the tax rates because the treatment is like an investment product and therefore the tax treatment should also be like an investment product. Plus, of course, uh, they say that uh, increase the limit to 10 lakhs so that we just make a strong footing, make uh, things so that the penetration of insurance can happen because normally the whole life policies may not generate big revenue for them. Uh, that is one reason why they are promoting kind of policies. And therefore, they say that we'll get the time for them to survive and make a little bit of more money in the process. So this is where their recommendations are, I uh, think, but uh, we have to wait and see, but I'm not sure the government will consider this because they may think in terms of giving the capital gains benefit to it. I don't think they will consider the threshold limit for it, but that's what the insurance company is trying to seek. So this is another very interesting uh, proposal with the TCS on uh, foreign demotants, which is another Proposal which uh, making a big change from first April 2023. Now, the TCS is slightly different from TDS. The TDS is tax detected at source, whereas TCS is tax collected at source. So, what's the difference? Suppose if I make a payment of 100, I cut 10 and give 90. So, in the case of a TCS, the person collecting, say, for the, what he will do is 100. Plus, we will add 10 and he will collect 110 and 10 he will deposit. So, the many people, uh, the, most of the uh, lot of uh, children are studying abroad. So, they have to remit money from India for this purpose. So, for which normally people try to do under the LRS or leverage remit scheme. So, it the whole purpose of introducing this section earlier was to track the amount remitted under the LRS scheme. That was the whole purpose. The TCS uh, on foreign remittance, according to the government, was never meant for collection of tax. It's not a tax raising measure. It is more to do a tracking of the amount which is going out of India through a liberalized remittance scheme or LRS. We don't know whether this is an attempt uh, to ensure that because already we all know dollar is well above 80 on a consistent basis. It has already achieved the status of a super senior citizen status on the tax balance. Because if you are above 80, you have a different basic exemption limit. Consistently, this maintaining the age of uh, maintaining above 80. I don't know whether the government has not said about this, whether that is the reason for it. But the outflow which you may have to spend if you're remitting to our children studying outside India or your family members staying outside India. Come 1st of April 2023, uh, your effective shell out, though you can get it back by way of uh, adjustment against your tax payment later on. 
but initially you may have to tell because the percentage hike is very, very, very steep, very steep. So I'll just give a quickly go to the consolidated table rather than going to each one of them, consulting the 10 constraints which we have. Now, if you are going to send it for the purpose of education, other than edu uh, by way of education loan, there's no change. It's still the same 0.5% of the amount in excess of 7 lakhs. There is no problem. So long as you have taken an education loan, sending it to your kids outside India, not a problem. You have to only, they will, the bank will take 0.5% more than what you may suppose equal to 100, they will take 100.5. Now, for the purpose of education or medical, other than education loan, again, there is no change in excess of 7 lakhs, 5 percent. That means if you send 10 lakhs to your, your kids for studying or studying outside there, you already give to the bank 10 lakhs, 50,000, and they will give the 50,000 credit you will, any case you will get. Now, suppose if you are trying to uh, go for an OTS uh, tour package, say you want to go with a, a travel agency to outside India, because most people, it's very difficult for you to organize your own trip. And therefore, you would prefer to uh, go with a ISOPC or somebody like uh, similar to them. And so, you if they say that five lakhs is a package cost, ten lakhs a package cost, you have to spend for them twelve lakhs. So you have to give them twelve lakhs to them, and the two lakhs you have paid will be adjusted against your tax. But it was only five percent, not all five percent. They have made it to twenty percent. That means tomorrow there could be two reasons. One. India itself is fantastic uh, tourist destinations are available. Why you want to go outside India? Why you want to go to Switzerland when you can go to Kashmir? Or you can go to many places in Himalaya, so like Simla. So many places are there. So your Switzerland is here. You want to go to Switzerland? Pay that extra 20% and go. And of course, uh, another indirect reason could be maybe are they just trying to curb the uh, amount here so that your uh, since we have the exchange fluctuations and US dollar costing 80, that they have not mentioned, but that also could be the reason. Any other case other than foreign to uh, packages, just 5%, that has also been moved to 20%. So that means only education, loan, and medical reason retained at 5%, and education added, and 0.5% for education. All of them without, uh, so they moved from 5 to 20, it's almost four times. So that means if you're going to say one crore, that becomes 1.2 crores. Though so you're going to get that 20 lakhs back, but that will be only when you file the tax return and get back. It's a very interesting change. Uh, the purpose of introducing the section last year was, I want to track the liberal Hamilton scheme. I never meant this for collection of tax. That was the mentioning, but now when it moved to 20 percent, uh, I think it goes beyond the purpose for which the section was introduced. Very interesting change. On account of the time constraint, I will uh, skip this slide. Uh, another proposal, which um, if the time permits, I'll take uh, Sri Ram and some of them. We can say time permits, I'll take another five minutes because for many uh, people, maybe in the business field, that is next to two yes, people. Yes, yes, please. So, uh, with the permission of uh, the house, uh, I request that. Uh, do we have a consent to take this meeting forward um, to, until 715? Yeah, I think yes. we should do that. Uh, yes, sir, we yes. can extend, no problem. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Suresh, another five to 10 minutes, please. So this is a very, uh, very important uh, change. In for business income, we have a couple of proposals of very lot of significance. Um, so this is a very, very interesting proposal, which uh, which one of them is already there for quite some time. Other one was introduced only the last year. So, so basically value of any benefit or purpose, whether convertible into money or not, arising from business or excess appropriation, is already taxed. Now, what does it mean? Uh, suppose after today's uh, program, my next speaker is going to be a uh, Engster Ramani. Uh, so he will give a piece of firebrand speaker. He will just make the GST good simple tax. Uh, as always, I borrow this from the prime minister. Always used to say good simple tax. He will make it to that extent with his power presentation. He will just make it. Up. So some of you watching this or listening to today's program, 
seeing his age and performance to say that ramani i just want to give you adikar for your fantastic presentation today now what this 284 says that adikar which is received by ramani on account of this will be taxed unfortunately though this provision is there for a considerable length of time many people due to ignorance of this have not offered this income for tax so primarily if you take the case of insurance companies uh, if an insurance agent makes a performance he sells it to one they give them some benefit they take them to foreign tour or they just give them some gifts so similarly car manufacturers uh, if the dealers perform well they give the dealers some discounts or uh, some benefits even to the dealers staff if they perform very well some gift coin uh, gift coupons are given or gold coins are given so computer industry when you achieve a particular target so it's across industries medical profession which is known for all the things that been they are the one uh, also been the main uh, reason for this importing so they also give a lot of benefit for these benefits whether they know the existence of this section or not has not been offered for tax so therefore last year uh, they brought a section called 194r which says if this benefit which is given by way of a benefit of person under 284 the person providing this should either pay the tax himself on the behalf of them for example if ramani gets a car from say samandam so what samandam should do is assuming the car is worth 90 lakhs he has to pay 10 lakhs as tds total amount in effect taxable for ramani will become 1 crore 10 lakhs tax is there right like alternatively what samandam can do is ask ramani you pay the tax on this show your tax allowance to me then only i will give the key many a times you will find that any the super sick upon many programs you will find a big key will be there none of these people get the actual key unless they pay the tax and give it to vijay tv or any other television channel conducting this program otherwise it will be only paper key alone actual key will be given only when they pay the tax and give it to star tv for star vijay then only they will give the actual key. so similar provision was also made in variety for r then when it is 28 four caught the attention of many people so the section was there for quite some time but five years back supreme court made a very interesting point that in order to apply the provisions of this 28 four there must be something received in kind if the benefit is only monetary only cash you cannot apply 28 so once 284 is not applicable obviously 184r also will not apply however the central board of direct taxes the highest administrative authority gave a circular for 184r that the provisions of 184r will apply whether the benefit is in kind or in cash or partly in cash partly in kind so therefore that every combination will attack 184r without understanding the fact that 184r itself is apply only for 284 and to apply 284 the most important requirement there there must be something in the form of kind with it only cash supreme court said section will not apply so what they have done now they now change the section it says whether convertible to money or not or in cash in kind partly in cash and partly in kind so that means what they are trying to do those even if cash is given as a form of value of benefit or work of it 284 to be attracted the decision of supreme court which i mentioned was given in the context of somebody obtained a loan and as a part of debt restructuring a portion of the loan has been written off so the issue before the supreme court is whether that write off of loan can it be considered as a value of benefit or perquisite given the supreme court said the loan is 
by way of money. And if you say that that loan is not payable, the benefit is there only in the form of money. And this section cannot be applied unless something you receive by way of kindness. So therefore, the context of the judgment is very important. So our loan write-off as a part of debt restructuring is not factored. Now what they brought in now, in cash or in kind or partly in cash and partly in cash. So therefore, the unintended danger of this change could be, suppose you have taken a loan and you are going for restructuring and as a part of restructuring, if any portion of the loan is written out or concession is given, then there is a possibility of income tax department taking a stand for. We have now changed the section. The Supreme Court decision is no longer applicable. You have to pay tax. So the very purpose of the bank giving you loan write-off is on account of your financial difficulties. And that's why they, any bank is going to give you a concession. But over and above that, if that is going to be subject to tax, it could have a bearing on the restructuring itself. So it is an unintended consequences, but we are heading for a very interesting day. But you have to be careful if you are going for this. The decision which I have mentioned was Supreme Court in Mahindra and Mahindra. So that has been nullified in this particular budget. But most importantly, the section clarifies these provisions will apply only from 1st April 2023. That means up to 31st March 2023, it may be safely assumed that this provision will not have any impact. The most important one, with that I will close my presentation, is relating to MSME. So, right now under Section 15 of the MSME Act, which is also uh, uh, is required to be reported by the company's auditor as to the amount due to MSME beyond the date specified there. It's already there. But however, the government is of a view that in order to speed up the amount due to MSME, we should use the income tax provisions. Now, under the present provisions of Income Tax Act in the sexual court part of the debate, there are certain expenditures you can claim only if you actually make the payment with a small exception you are allowed to make the payment till you file your tax returns. So ITR filing date where you can make the payment. So like the taxes, the indirect taxes, the uh, PF payments and some of the expenditures which are covered there in part of the other. In this list, they are now included, for, uh, included amount payable to MSMEs also. With a very important point, Unlike other payments where they are given ITR filing due date, for MSME payments, they said you can claim only on payment basis or if you have to pay within the due date as for the MSME Act. So therefore, the extended time till ITR filing date is not available if the amount is payable to MSME. So there are two ways in which you can look at if you are an MSME, the next 30 days or 45 days of this financial year, that is a good point, collection point for you. You tell your person, boss, if you don't pay, this amount will not be allowed to as an expense. That means you are going to end up in paying an extra tax. Therefore, release the payment to me when compared to somebody else who is a large enterprise because in any case, if you don't pay to him also, you can still claim it as an expense. But the amount which is due to me, if you're not going to pay, that is not going to be allowed to you as an expense, which is a good reason for them to make the collection. Because uh, I'm sorry that you can't do this, so it's applicable only for the next year. But I'm saying at least for the next year onwards, you can do that, not for the next 45 days. But the other way of looking at could be if you are I'm making the payment to MSME from next year, that is a one point which you should make up in your mind. But only thing what you should not do is this proposal is intended intended to revive or increase the cash flow of MSME. I don't want you to think, okay, fine, if they have this provision, let me not 
buy from MSME so that I will not have this problem. I think that should not be the approach. The purpose is to give more cash to them so that they employ many people, they survive because their cash flow problems are sorted. I think we should not have a reverse thinking in the process and deprive them of the money. So very important uh, proposal with no extended time till filing date, which is available for your PF or GST or other payments covered by monetary. Apart from this, for MSME, so they also said, if you you have a scheme called the six percent or eight percent of your turnover, you can offer as your income, for which the turnover cap has been kept at two crores. So up to two crores, if you are going to receive in digital mode, you have to offer only six percent as your income. If it is other in digital mode, eight percent is your. So for which the limit was kept as two crores, and that two crores limit has been raised to three crores, with the only condition being your cash receipts from your turnover cannot be more than five percent in cash comp cash component of. So long as that condition, see whereas for moving to 10 crores for tax audit, expenditure as well as receipt, five percent cap is there for non-cash. But for going for two to three crores. Is only for turnover. So long as your turnover of five percent alone is cash, you can go for the scheme and offer six percent or eight percent, as the case may be, as your income, which is a very important concession. Given similar scheme has been extended to the professionals also, for which the limit for going for presumptive scheme. That means I, if I'm a I'm a professional, I can offer fifty percent of my receipts as income, but that fifty has been moved to seventy five. Provided my cash receipts are only five percent. So these are a lot of proposals are there. Uh, uh, definitely, so we may not have the time. So only seven we have over exceeded, and uh, so Ramani is also waiting for discussing indirect proposals. So I thank uh, Siki for facilitating this uh, budget seminar. It's always uh, a pleasure talking to all of you. So now I'll hand over back to Ramani. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Suresh, because uh, if, if explaining it to us so tedious, you can imagine what it would be without any explanation. We've had some very um, important clarifications given by Mr. Suresh. If there are any questions for Mr. Suresh quickly, I'd like them to be posted or you can raise your hand. Uh, till I wait for that, uh, I just have one thing with this foreign, foreign travel. There is a clause which says any other case. Now, suppose I suppose that I'm asking on behalf of many members here. Suppose somebody wants to visit their son or daughter abroad. Uh, would that come under a foreign tour or any other case? Uh, basically, only if you are going to engage uh, a travel agent, uh, you know, for going for a foreign travel. So I think the overseas tour package. That's what they okay. talk about. If you book an airline ticket on and go there, I don't think that's going to be a chance. Even if it's booked through a travel agent? No, it is should be a overseas to package by itself. Package, it's normally right. what happens, yeah. So see, uh, you can, see Marley, as you said. A, exactly, yeah. Okay. That is what it's intended to be. Right, okay. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Suresh, please? Another interesting point that struck me, Mr. Suresh, correct me if I'm wrong, or being too naive, uh, you mentioned about um, the possibility of interpretation by the tax authorities towards the end of your presentation, um, that it should not be intended to in a different way. So are we looking at the possibility of the taxman's overreach again with this vagueness? Uh, hey, uh, I, I think the best way of this could be the board can come out the circular. Uh, this is our intention, so therefore uh, they should give out instructions, not to come for a genuine write-off of loan, so that uh, the clarification, if it comes from the highest administrative authority, that will solve the problem. Otherwise, uh, definitely, I uh, know uh, any ambitious officers could always resort to it. Yes, uh, perhaps on that note, we could uh, request uh, the house could request uh, Siki to send uh, feedback to the Union Finance Ministry seeking clarifications officially with the inputs from Mr. Suresh and others. Uh, is that uh, acceptable to the house? 
Can everybody. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Sam. And definitely, what we do is after this uh, event, we typically collect all the yes. points which are to be represented to the government, and we'll send one memorandum to the. Government. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sriram. If there are no other questions, I'll give another few seconds. I'm, uh, I can see Mr. Ramni, uh, Ms. Ramni raring to go because goods and services tax has always been an issue. It will continue, it will continue to be an issue. So if there are no further questions for Mr. Suresh, uh, on behalf of Mr. Sriram, Mr. Ms. Saranya, the others at uh, Siki, I thank Suresh very much for a very pointed, clear, clear ex explanation of the direct taxes. And I hand it over to uh, our friend Ramani, take it forward with the indirect taxes, simplified yeah. into goods and services taxes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, all. Uh, this is Ramani from ENY. So I thank yeah, you so much. Would you like to also uh, share your video, please? They'd like to yeah, see you as well, if possible. If feasible. Thank you. Yeah, so right now I don't think I'll be able to switch on my video. So I just go with this. So one second. Sure, sure. Thank you, Ramani. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just to start off with the indirect tax proposals, thank you, Suresh, sir. I think you gifted me an Audi car. I'm expecting a delivery of it very shortly. So I'll quickly move on to the indirect tax proposals in the budget. The first one being the goods and services tax. Um, uh, it's as expected as usual in the every budget, whatever is the previous council, GST council meeting uh, discussions and uh, agenda points which have been finalized that have been brought into this budget. So basically this budget amendments also carry the amendments to the CGST Act and IGST Act pertaining to the 47th and 48th GST council meeting and ma ma majority of them would be covered in my ensuing slides. One interesting point to be noted is generally every finance act has an effective date uh, for GST provisions that, that the same would be notified from a subsequent date or when the central government may decide. Uh, however, no such enabling provisions has been given in this finance bill 23, while we expect the same would be provided in an updated draft of the finance bill because states will also have to amend the SGST laws and post which the amendments would take effect. So this is one interesting point that we need to note. Moving on to the amendments, the first one is applicability of composition scheme. So uh, pre prior to this amendment, persons who were enabled, who were undertaking, who were uh, opting for composition scheme were not allowed to supply goods through e-commerce operators such as Amazon Flipkart. Now, given the growing trend of e-commerce operations, government has decided to relax this particular conditions. And moving forward, we may have more suppliers available for the same set of commodities that by enabling purchases with more options. So this is the first amendment. And if any provisions are being misused with respect to the same penal provisions have been given to e-commerce operators to uh, for them to charge with a penalty in case these provisions are being misused. So the provision also tells that you are not allowed to make interstate supply of goods through e-commerce operators. So just to have a check in, uh, check in place, the government has also put a penalty on the e-commerce operator so that these provisions are not misused. Moving forward to the next one is ITC reversal for non-payment. Uh, there is a condition under section 16 which prescribes that in case payment to vendor is not made within 180 days, then you may have to reverse the ITC and once the payment is being made to the vendor, you are entitled to avail the credit. Now, rule 37 was amended in the CGST rules while the 47, 48 GST council meeting and they had brought in a provision that interest under section 50 will be levied only and only when there is no sufficient balance of ITC. Now, similar enabling provisions have been made in the CGST Act. Now, one interesting point to note here is at the time of reavailment of credit, uh, the wordings or the language uses payment should be made to the supplier. Now, there could be issues that may arise owing to the fact that if the supplier has undergone a reorganization or if the supplier is under insolvency proceedings, what would happen to such recredits? We'll have to wait and watch for the same in the due course of time. Now, moving forward, there are a couple of important amendments that I would like to cover. The first one being the computation of value of exam supply. So the government wants to notify a few classes of transactions pertaining to warehouse goods which are supplied before clearance for home consumption. They want to bring it under the ambit of exam supply so that 
ITC reversal attributable to such exempt supply would be undertaken. This is more to do with duty free shops operations. So, because of prior High Court rulings wherein it has been held that duty free shops would be enabled for refund for supplies to their departure passengers and they would not be required to reverse ITC in case they supply to arrival passengers. Now, this was not the intention of the government and they have brought in this amendment to notify duty free shops as one of those categories. Now, we'll have to really wait and watch whether the government is only going to notify for duty free shops or they are going to extend it for any other transactions. Moving forward, is my, the next amendment pertains to CSR expenditure. In 2015, income tax had a provision to tell that any expenditure incurred for the purpose of CSR will not be eligible as a business expenditure. Similar to that, GST law has been amended to tell that any goods or service, any ITC pertaining to goods or services used or intended to be used for the purpose of corporate social responsibility, CSR under the Companies Act is not eligible as credit. Now, this has given up to some interesting questions to, to begin with what would happen if I am not an entity who is required under Companies Act to do such CSR, but irrespective of the fact I keep doing CSR, will I be entitled for credit? What will happen if I make expenditure over and above the limits prescribed in the CSR? Uh, limits as prescribed under the Companies Act. What would happen if I carry forward such ex excess expenditure in the next year and what would be the ITC reversal implications on that and whether at all it is a business expenditure or not. So uh, these questions have been arisen and the, uh, the view seems to be largely that until and unless this amendment is notified. Uh, a view that has been circulating is that you are entitled to take credit with respect to CSR expenditure while the other questions are even are open even now. Moving forward is an interesting amendment is a person who is engaged only in exempt supply of goods or services is not required to take registration. However, if he has any reverse charge liability, a confusion arose whether he needs to take registration or not. Now the government has clarified that irrespective of any category wherever he is required to take registration if he is only engaged in supply of exempted goods or services or he is an agriculturist is not required to take any registration. Now we will have to really wait and watch what will happen for the past period cases where they were engaged only in exempt activity but they had still re taken registration and paid tax whether whether such uh, taxpayers could go for refund is something that we will have to evaluate in a greater detail. Moving forward is interest on delayed refund government generally sanctions interest in case if they delay the refund which is due to to the taxpayer now prior to this amendment they are told immediately after the 60th day of receipt of application they would be granting us the interest at the rate of six percent now government is coming up with a suggestion that they will have to prescribe they will prescribe the rules now the manner in which such interest will be computed this is more likely for cases where there is a high risk exporter transaction where the government is not a default but the processing of refund takes a lot of time to get completed and hence the government may have thought to kept a checks and balances in place with, with respect to interest as well. Moving forward are other legislative amendments basically which pertains to decriminalization of offenses under GST. This has been the larger objective of the government to decriminalize offenses under various acts. Now, under GST, they have increased that limit from 1 crore to 2 crore and they have notified few offences which may not be categorized as an offence which requires a prosecution. And, and, in, and also one more amendment which came in was that the place of supply of goods for a place of supply of services with respect to transportation of goods for export transactions, they have brought it back to the original provision. Hitherto, it was kept as outside India in case of export transaction, resulting in IGST levy and confusions, um, uh, confusions prevailing with respect to availment of credit. And given that an exemption which was available was withdrawn very recently, they have moved it back to the original uh, provision which was there in the law. And there are also uh, amendments pertaining to OADAR regulations wherein they have expanded the scope of the ambit of OADAR services and they have also given a new definition for non-taxable online recipient removing the requirement for use of business commerce or other than business or commerce just to bring in more clarity on those particular provisions and they have also brought in an outer cut off time limit to file returns under GST law uh, they have told that you can't file any returns under GST law after three years from the due date of filing return and there is also one more interesting thing which they are coming up is GSTN is allowed to share data between 
two entities uh, between other entities for non gst purposes as well after they receive the consent from supplier and or recipient now broadly if you see the changes in the gst law they are more towards giving effect for the gst council uh, minutes now i move on to the customs related amendments uh, there was an uh, amendment in customs act which prescribed that uh, any exemption which has been given under customs would automatically expire after 2 years from the date of issuance of such notification and such expiry would fall on 31st march of the year in which such 2 uh, years is getting lapsed now government is under obligation to grant various exemptions for various categories and hence they have excluded this 2 year expiry limit for the following notified transactions such as multilateral bilateral agreements constitutional authority schemes under ftp etc these are situations where government is obligated to give exemptions and putting an expiry period would only go against the objective of giving the exemption and hence they have brought in a particular provision for excluding this two year time limit for this transactions and there have been various duty rationalization rates uh, for pro to promote make in india and to make ease of doing business and there have been various increase and modifications of rates in few places they have also uh, kept the effective rate of duty as same but they have only increased the uh, basic customs duty and ready and exempted sws and vice versa and they have also excluded solar power plant from the purview of project imports this was an offshoot of previous notifications or previous amendments that happened in october 22 they have given effect to that in customs tariff now and couple of other uh, minimal amendments with respect to levy of anti anti dumping duty safeguard duty and countervailing duty the government has now told that the determination and order of the such duties will be made as per prescribed under the rules and it is not available for uh, assessees to make an appeal against any order determine any order of the central government determining such anti dumping duty and the time there has been a time limit which has been prescribed for settlement commission to pass an order within 9 months from the date of application uh, failing which the proceeding stands abated so and one last thing is that sestat has been empowered to deal with cases with respect to interstate disputes on account of central sales tax since the csta wa was not in operation for quite some time so broadly these were the changes that were available under the gst and customs and other allied laws um, i am really i apology for rushing it too fast uh, owing to shortage of time i had to do it but i am happy to take up any questions moving forward thank you thank you very much ramani that was a very precise presentation and we also get to know where the priorities for the government lies with respect especially to the export and import its constitutional obligations um any questions for ramani please mr ramani please if there are no questions it is my pleasure to now wrap up very quickly by saying that uh congra i on behalf of the uh, southern india chamber of commerce and industry i thank i thank all the three presenters uh, sudha mayapan suresh and ramani for a very enlightened presentation what was particularly important is that they set a context to everything and uh, it is very clear as to what the government has in mind they brought out what the government's intent was the possible areas gray areas of misinterpretation the need for clarification and i think uh, the members would agree with me that we go away more enlightened than we were when we came in i thank um, saranya for the arrangements and sri ram for the opportunity and on behalf of all the members here and on behalf of the speakers i express my thanks to mr sri ram and uh, the only request is uh, uh, there have been a lot of talk about gifts being given on behalf of x y and z uh, we would come back to you suresh for the tax exemptions required at that time <laughs> and uh, we'd uh, like you to do at the same way i think we should also request uh, saranya to uh, take on board the suggestions given by all the enlightened members what comes very clearly from this in very brief is and i'm talking on behalf of sudha as well who has uh, stepped out for a few minutes is that the budget seems to be a disincentivizing factor for savings hello sudha welcome back uh, uh please uh, sudha and ramni if you can switch on your 
videos, we could uh, have this. It appears to be a decent center for saving. What it would mean on gross capital formation, what it would mean on incent on inflation, are things to be concerned about. What it would mean on in, uh, export import, how would it uh, shift the trade balance is another thing. One unspoken factor everywhere is that uh, the services comprise a very large part of the national income, the GDP. Uh, what it's, how is it going to have an impact on the services sector is something we'll have to, we also have to consider in our response to the budget to the union government. Uh, with these few words, if there are any final words from our three main speakers, Suresh, Sudha, and uh, Ramani, I, I look forward to that, please. I open the house back to the main speakers. In, in reverse order, uh, Ramani, do you have anything more to add, please, Mr. Ramani? Nothing no, from my side. He's not here. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Then, uh, then Suresh, anything more to add, please? I think so. I think uh, Sri Ram can give some final words, as okay. always. Right. And Sudha, anything more to add from your end? Right. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. And I give this, uh, give the uh, space back to Mr. Sri Ram for his final, final views. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Dr. Samandam. And uh, thanks to T.G. Suresh, uh, Sudha Vijapan, and uh, Ramani. Uh, and also thank uh, each one of the participants for patiently uh, uh, you know, even after the delays, they stayed back and, uh, you know, enjoyed the presentation, I hope. And uh, the whole of the deliberations, I'm sure, were very useful. And, uh, you know, uh, basically, as I set the context in the beginning, we wanted to do a real deep dive. And uh, the 10 days uh, gap between the actual uh, budget day presentation and today, uh, we could really, uh, you know, uh, go in detail and depth to analyze and the TGS, uh, for want of uh, time, we could not really complete his presentation. So much details are there. And good part of, about this whole budget is that we have seen, even though few and far proposals in indirect access, there are quite a bit of opportunity out there. So uh, the, the whole uh, aspects of the depth of the budget could be, uh, you know, canvassed as part of this presentation. And I'm very happy about it. I'm sure each of the participants got benefited with this kind of in-depth analysis, uh, you know, deliberations, which we could uh, carry out uh, from the Southern India Chamber of Commerce. With that, I would like to uh, really close this, uh, you know, uh, session. And uh, thank you once again, all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a thank happy you. Thank you. The meeting is now closed. <laughs>